Well, thank you for coming out on this rainy day. Um, this has been many, many years in the making uh, to get you here. Um, this is the 21st annual Northern California Time of Remembrance and the grand opening of the Uprooted and American Story Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sharon Ito, and it's wonderful to be a part of this event. Um, it's a sold-out event. It really was, but I see a few empty seats, and it's because, one, the rain, and two, a number of people have tested positive for COVID, so they couldn't be with us today. Well, the, the museum and the Northern California Time of Remembrance Committee, which is composed of four local JACL chapters, are behind this event and they welcome you today. So let's hear it for those JCL chapters. For those chapters have worked with the museum for over 20 years so that the Japanese American incarceration during World War II is not forgotten. Uprooted became the museum's longest running exhibit. How about that? All right, so it was a tall order when the museum closed the exhibit last summer and decided to do a redesign. The museum says what we have today is a fully rebuilt technology enhanced exhibit. It is a thoroughly modern historic exhibit. And in a moment, you'll meet Kevin Sayama. He is the wow factor of <laughs> this exhibit. Uh, he is with CNG Partners. It's the award winning studio behind the project and they're from New York. Um, today's celebration will also include a typo performance Ikebana demonstrations, origami crane folding, exhibit tours, and a whole lot more. But first, the executive director of the California Museum and a tremendous friend of the Japanese American community, please welcome Amanda Meeker. Hello. As she mentioned, I'm Amanda Meeker, Executive Director of the California Museum. I want to welcome you all here today. I'm so glad that you could be here to celebrate the opening of our new Uprooted and American Story exhibit. Many of you know that the exhibit has its roots in Mary Sukumoto's education program about the Japanese American incarceration, launched in Elk Grove in 1983 as one of the earliest programs focused on the, on the incarceration. Since Mary's program moved here in 2003, over 100,000 students from across the region have participated in the program in which camp survivors and their children share their experiences. And we have a number of docents here today from the TOR program. Would you please stand up so that we can give you a big round of applause. Um, the program couldn't be here without you. For those of you who are familiar with the previous exhibit, you'll still find old favorites like Ted Cabana's barracks, Stan Meta's guard tower. But you'll also find new artifacts, added interactive media, including a um, AI component that allows you to hold virtual conversations with incarceration and survivors, including Kyo Sato, who is here today. Um, okay, so you'll also find an entirely refreshed concept courtesy of the award-winning New York design firm CG Partners, who, whose project lead Kevin Sayama you'll be hearing from in just a moment. I'd also like to recognize all the camp survivors here today. Would anyone who is a survivor please stand up?
The reason why I'm so excited about this new exhibit is that it will ensure that what you went through, what your parents went through, your grandparents, and how the incarceration continues to affect younger generations will continue to be a part of this museum for many years to come. And perhaps most importantly, that museum visitors will continue to learn from what happened so that we can guard against something like that ever happening to another group of people again. Before I close, I'd like to also thank our exhibit advisory group, which is Mariel Sukamoto, Eileen Nishio, Eileen Otsuchi, Les Uchida, Janice Lusak, and Greg Stan and Christine Mena. For those committee members who are here today, please stand up as well. Uh, and with that, we will move on to the next segment. And just thank you again for being here. So glad to share this day with you. Thank you, Amanda. I wanted to tell you that proceeds from today's event will support the museum's annual Time of Remembrance field trip program. Donors are essential in keeping this exhibit alive and relevant. We'd like to recognize a couple of major contributors. Lorna Fong, who is a longtime community friend. Lorna is the one who tested positive for COVID. She was supposed to be my ride today. <laughs> She's doing fine, but anyway, she tested positive earlier this week. And then also we want to thank Kenji Takuma, Nichi Bay Foundation. We also want to thank our educational partners. They continue to support activities for students here, first-hand accounts of the Japanese American experience during World War II. This educational program meets the California history standards for fifth graders in the study of the U.S. Constitution. We want to thank the museum. And the largest part of our Time of Remembrance activities is an eight-week educational program for approximately 4,000 to 5,000 students a year. They tour the exhibit, they hear from the camp survivors, the docents, and they come to understand the responsibility to stand up for their rights and for the rights of others. We want to shine a light on the Elk Grove Unified School District and Superintendent. Elk Grove has been the nation's leading school district in educating students about the Japanese American incarceration and what lessons this holds for protecting our constitutional rights. For the past 40 years, Elk Grove has been the only California school board to pass a resolution commemorating the Time of Remembrance program. The district has sponsored teacher training, developed curriculum, and provided student education with friends from the Florence JCL and other community partners. So thank you to Elk Grove. the museum's uprooted exhibit is a special collection at the Sacramento State Library. And as you heard Amanda say, nearly 30 years ago, with the foresight of Elk Grove school teacher Mary Sukimoto, the Sacramento State Library joined with the community to start the now extensive Japanese American archival collection and established an advisory committee. With contributions from the community, the library has preserved thousands of artifacts and documents, sponsored exhibits, educated countless students, and gained the attention of researchers from around the world. Many of the artifacts in the Uprooted Museum come from Sac State's Japanese American Archival Collection. Thank you, Sac State. murals when you signed in in the lobby. Uh, Janice Nakashima, an artist, created those for uh, today's event. So thank you to Janice. Okay, I know we want to get to We do want to acknowledge some special guests, so I'll try to get through the list very quickly. Um, Amy Katzman, she is the library of the Sacramento State Library. Julie Thomas, she is the archivist for the Japanese American Archival Collection at Sacramento State. 
We have Elfro School Board members who are with us. Carmine Forsina and Nancy Chiris Espinoza and Superintendent Chris Hoffman. Um, from the San Francisco Japanese Consulate, we have a representative. Ayai Yoshimoto is here. Um, Sasuke, Sasuke Ina, Kiyoshi and Akemi Ina, John and Jerry Honda are here from Tsu for solidarity. The president of the Asian Pacific Bar Association of Sacramento, Jennifer Pitcher, is with us. Greg Wada, he will be leading the Koyasan Taiko group later this afternoon. We also want to say thank you to the four foreign four JACL chapters. And I want to start with Florin. The co-presidents are Andy Noguchi and Josh Kaizuka. From Lodi, the president, Arlene Mataga. Placer County, Nancy Whiteside is the president. And from Sacramento JCL, Mika Samogura uh, is here. We have former California Assembly member, Monica Yamato with us. And from the Council of American Islamic Relations, CARE, Bassam El Khara. We have Physicians for Social Responsibility, Harry Wong is the president. Rhonda Rios Kratzman, the Lions and Campaign for Immigration Reform. And I think, let me quickly look over this list to see that I have everybody. But I did want to say I didn't see an old friend of ours. Um, Radio host Tom Nakashima is here. So let's give a round of applause to all of us. Okay, are you ready to meet Kevin Sayama? Yeah. Yeah. He is a senior consultant with the creative studio of CG Partners in New York. He led the redesign of the upgraded exhibit. Kevin, together with a team of multimedia designers, content developers, and producers, will have you saying, wow, when you tour the exhibit later this afternoon. Uh, quickly, his background, Kevin was trained as an architect working on affordable housing in San Francisco. He was headed to law school when a friend told him about a summer job in New York. They would be working on an exhibit for the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles on the incarceration. At the time, Kevin admitted he knew very little about the camps. The topic rarely, if ever, came up at his home, and he never learned about it or heard about it in school. Working on America's concentration camps in 1994 opened his eyes to his own history. And after experience working with Karen Ishizuka and Bob Nakamura, it got him asking questions about his own past. And it also dawned on him that he wasn't going to law school, he wasn't going to draw blueprints. He found his mission in life, and that was to marry history with storytelling through design. Rebuilding the uprooted exhibit has been a very personal journey for Kevin. It was about coming home again. So please welcome the creative force behind the redesign uprooted and American story exhibit. Kevin Sayama is here to chat with you and thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you all for inviting me to talk about this exhibit that's so, <clears throat> so important to me. Um, came from Japan in 1956, and my mom was born here. Um, and really, it's her story. She went uh, to the camps. Um, my father was actually uh, the one who told me more about the story, because he was angry. And he, even as a Japanese uh, first immigrant, um, he saw the injustice. My mom, she was more 
like, well, that happened. Um, and she didn't really want to get too riled up about it. So I never really kind of understood the story. Um, you know, he, he would just say, it's like, we're not going to first cast, never. Um, and, you know, didn't quite understand why, but um, I came to understand later. Um, I didn't really catch the enormity of the story, really, um, even as she kind of gave me drips and drafts of it. Um, it really wasn't that clear to me. Um, so I was always surprised. <laughs> um, you know, uh, getting into things, asking kind of difficult questions, but um, she tolerated me. She was a, a much better uh, kid, I think, than I was. Um, and her parents were uh, my grandmother, um, uh, was a Japanese school teacher. And my grandfather was the bishop of uh, the Zen Shuji Soto Mission um, in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, they went to different spots. Um, they were both arrested um, right after Pearl Harbor. Um, my grandmother was sent to Sybil Brand uh, Jail in Los Angeles. And then from there was sent to Santa Anita, where she complained bitterly about uh, the smell of manure. Um, and my grandfather was arrested in San Francisco. Um, from the records, I could tell that they went to, he went to Turlock and she went to Santa Anita, but still trying to figure out the story. Um, and my mom went with him to Turlock. Um, eventually, they ended up in Hewa, um, where my grandfather uh, was, I think that's him, you know, I found this photograph um, from Hewa. Uh, 1944, uh, the Buddhist church um, there. Um, kind of looks like him, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that must be him. Um, and they stayed there till uh, October 1945, which is pretty late because you needed to make sure that everyone had a place to go to. At least that's what I understood. Um, so that's part of the story. Um, in doing work on this exhibit, I kind of dug into uh, different stories uh, that we wanted to illustrate, and one of them was about the CWRIC, um, which is uh, such an important story about reparations and the search for that so reparations and, and repair, uh, redress. Um, but the other part of the story that was more personal is that um, her best friend, Amy Nass, um, testified. And I didn't know that until I did the little digging. Um, the other part I didn't know was that in her testimony, she talks about um, her best friend. And her best friend's mother was a Japanese school teacher. And her father was a Buddhist priest for taking away. And my friend was sad and terrified. Well, that's the first time I knew how she actually felt, because she didn't tell me that. Um, I think, you know, as we explore our histories, um, sometimes it just comes up as you dig. Um, you know, this exhibit is really uh, important, I think, because it's a uh, it's like a, a periodic thing that we need to do. Um, and bear with me, I'm just going to take a little sidebar here. <clears throat> In Japan, um, there are these temples, uh, the Issei Jin, Jingu uh, Shrine. Every 20 years, they tear it completely down and rebuild it. Um, and you kind of ask, why do they do that? My thought is that you do that because um, the very act of destruction and renewal um, helps keep the place significant to the community. Um, it's kind of 
I, I call it a transference of care. Um, doing it helps focus us on the story and you know, refreshing the story. Um, and it's kind of this renewal that's so important um, for the community um, and for the story. Who tells the story? Um, Really, that story was first told uh, through the time of Remembrance folks, um, who really wanted to keep the story alive. And they built the first exhibits. And these first pieces um, were so important that we felt like they had to stay in the exhibit, um, even as it gets renewed. Um, they were part of the DNA of telling the story. Um, it's the it's this kind of continuity that we're looking for um, when we kind of tell the story again. Um, the uh, you know, Ted Kubata, Christine, and Stan Meta, and those guys um, they they wanted to tell the story and. It, took bits and pieces and uh, crafted an exhibit. Um, and the museum became the place that they could tell the story. Um, it's also a place where we could gather the evidence and kind of present it to people. Um, the other part of this, and really the heart of this, is that there are we have the testimony of the witnesses, um, the eyewitnesses, survivors, um, who experienced this and basically gave it a human side. It's not just objects, but it's real storytelling. Um, we knew that every person visiting wouldn't get um, the Jefferson tour that's so powerful. Um, we needed to make a place that could keep this going um, and keep the voices going um, you know, far past uh, you and I. Um, and these shared experiences are really uh, what we try to not just preserve, but to raise back up again. Um, speaking of voices, when we started working on this exhibit, we had this copy of uh, a cryptic letter from Eleanor Roosevelt to Mary Spumoto and um, Julie Thomas uh, from Cal State uh, had saved this and her you know, the archives had saved this. Um, but we only had that voice. Um, and then we did a little bit of research and we found out, yes, the other side exists. You know, this was at the FDR archives um, and uh, the library and archives. Not, but not just that, but all these letters. Um, and we see, it's like, we, it's, it's really this powerful voice that we, uh, we get this eyewitness account from inside the camps at the time. Um, so when we go digging, <laughs> We can find all kinds of uh, feelings and emotions that we might not have had access to. Um, we were brought in in the fall of 2021 to help renew these exhibits um, with media and um, to kind of inject uh, more ways to help people understand. Uh, this is all relevant today. Um, it was rich, and uh, there's you know, there was all kinds of uh, material to work from. Um, but we were also asked to uh, update it with um, this idea that you know civil rights and um, this kind of empowerment and even the issues of resistance could be addressed. Um, 
back in 1994, when I worked on the uh, America's Concentration Camps exhibit, um, we we were looking. It was almost like it was a first generation exhibit. Um, we were looking to gather uh, stories, um, and it was really more about gathering than about telling. Um, this exhibit is very different, um, and you know we didn't have as much space as they did. Um, it's a very small uh, room, um, and we thought there was a lot of story in there, and we needed to help uh, people access the story a little bit. Uh, I guess, you know, in a clear way. Um, one of the things we did is we kept the barracks central, but we said, okay, we're just going to make people go through this chronology um, in a way that they get the whole story. Um, we also, uh, we made people kind of maneuver through it um, so that they don't see everything at once. Um, it also allowed for everyone to kind of read the exhibit um, from left to right because it used to go the other way around. We also uh, decided to inject different colors for different uh, time periods so that um, you kind of get the sense of an era. The other thing we tried to do was to take images and um, kind of hit you with them as these markers of time and of those moments. The other thing we did was we, we went through the collection and try to glean um, inspiration from the collection. Um, one thing I noticed when I was working on the uh, exhibit in Los Angeles was how many birds were carved. And it struck me even in 1994, that those birds, like, I don't think there were that many birds at <laughs> um, And so I, I just thought, it's like, this must be aspirational. <laughs> You know, this must be about flying away. Um, so we looked at this idea that um, the birds and this kind of notion um, that cranes were uh, a symbol of, of good tidings. Uh, especially the thousand grains. And one, one kind of moment that uh, made sense to me is when the, my friend uh, Karen Ishizuka uh, said, you know, says, like, oh, you know about Tsu for solidarity. And I said, no, I don't actually. Um, and so kind of was diving into that. Um, and I thought, you know what, it, it kind of fits. Um, I think the first imagery that hit my head uh, when I thought about what, what would tie this all together was this flock of, of birds flying away, away from the camps, out. And then the crane itself could be something we could take as a motif and uh, develop the exhibits around. We thought about it as this kind of unfolding of the paper, that inside of the crane was a story. If we unfolded it, we might find the story. So I don't know if you can tell, but the exhibit is really made of like folds. You know, different parts and pieces are revealed as you unfold the whole uh, crane. Um, it all 
also shows that it's not a uh, it's not just a straightforward story either. Um, we surfaced a lot of stories about resistance, um, truly like things that have been kind of sensitive in the community. Um, and uh, as we unfold the frame, we see these stories that have been hidden away. Um, and yet the cranes, as a group, um, are still a community. Um, the community, um, and we were kind of debated the colors, but we just settled on white because it was the neutral color, and we could, uh, I you know, Thank you, everyone, for help fold those cranes. Uh, and I apologize for that waterproof paper was very, very hard to fold by now. Um, but they're beautiful. Each one is an individual. They're all different. Um, and I think, you know, we celebrate that. Um, they are still part of that community, but each one in their own way. Um, we use it in different ways, uh, you know, different motifs, um, uh, these different patterns. Um, but the concentration of them are towards the end. And you know, we wanted to kind of say that you know, these thousand cranes are really part of hope, um, you know, hope for the peace and justice that we all seek. Um, the other thing we kind of addressed was words. Um, you know, some of these are about terminology. I mean, our caption to, to this was that, you know, the conversation over language and terminology is an important one. It helps uncover the realities and trauma that Japanese Americans endured during this period. But it's also about, like, what they were up against. You know, these words were used as weapons. Um, and, you know, even in the way we did it, we just wanted the old terminology to fade back into the yellow and the white to pop out. You know, that's, those are the words. Um, the other thing we did is reconsider the title. And it's still uprooted, but we went through a lot of different names. Um, and we decided that, you know, in the end, uh, uproot is still the right term um, because it's both, you know, what happened uh, in leaving home, but you're uprooted from everything you believed in. Um, so it was a powerful term. We just said it, it should stay. The second part was a little bit more complicated. Um, we all agreed it was a little bit too long and too specific. We wanted to broaden the story, um, but we didn't know exactly what we should end up with. We got rid of uh, you know, barbed wire or World War II. And then, that's when the great debate started. Mm -hmm. Is it a Japanese American story? Or is it an American story? And that was hard. Um, and I'm sure there are people out here still, <laughs> still weigh in on this. Um, but we decided that an American story was the more powerful way to move forward. Because really, this exhibits about moving forward. Um, and that an American story is what you leave with. This is not just about Japanese Americans. This is a Japanese American story, but if we don't look at it as an American story, then we don't learn anything. Um, because it's, it's got to matter to more than Japanese Americans. Um, in, in the end, it's sort of this, we needed to also um, Think of this as, you know, when we talk about the temple and working on the temple, 
um, a kind of regeneration of energy. Um, the pilgrimages were kind of seminal in that sense that there was a desire to uh, look at the story and get some energy out of the actual sites. Um, whether it was Tule Lake or Manstar, there are now pilgrimages to every uh, site. Um, and what came out of that um, is actually a little bit bigger. Um, and we knew that the story couldn't just end with the letter and a check. That, was, that didn't seem adequate. Um, and so we asked uh, Kimuya and her sister, Sacha, uh, to work on uh, a film. And you guys should all kind of stop and watch it. And, you know, you just stand up. And, Now, it's, the story has to keep going. Um, and the, it was such a fine balance between identity and action. Um, I think uh, when you hear their stories, it's, it is quite moving. Um, and also, there's a lot of hope in it. So, um, you know, I do encourage you to stop at that last video and watch it. Um, my thoughts. <clears throat> you don't really have a temple here. This is not what it's about. Um, but um, this is a safe place to tell stories. Um, and, you know, thank you, Amanda Meeker, for making this safe place to tell the story. Um, and, you know, Amanda pushed us to tell the story in a way that is um, respectful, but with a little edge. Um, and so really around that, you know, we can build a community, fight injustice, as a, and it, it, because it's rearing its ugly head again. In fact, uh, uh, Kino and her sister worked against the Never Again title um, that we had for that last piece because it is happening, right? Um, and, you know, just borrowing some words from one you know, of those folks, uh, we need to stay strong and, and vigilant and keep telling our stories. Thank you. for a few questions before the tours start and the activities. Uh, so you will also have a chance to talk to Kevin. Uh, he'll be in the lobby later. But if you have questions, raise your hand. Let me know. I know we have people who came from around California, but also out of state. I saw a friend from Chicago who flew in just for this event. So a lot of people wanted to see this and a chance to meet the person behind it. Questions? All right. I know this is a predominantly Japanese American audience. <laughs> Don't live up to stereotypes. All right. Yes, please. Hi, Kevin. It's Julie Thomas. Thank Hi, you Julie. Thank you person. Oh, when your mother and father were arrested yeah. after a bomb in Pearl Harbor, how long were they held? Or were they released what kind of immediately? So I do not know that. Um, when I uh, went searching through NARA, um, there are actually people who are really helpful at NARA, and they, they answer, they, they do a little bit of research for you. And they said, oh, you're going to have to go to Justice Department. And that's a whole other kind of search. 
So I need to start that part of the search um, to go through it and find those records because I'm sure that's kind of the path I have to take. I know my step grandfather ended up in Lordsburg. So, you know, it gets complicated, right? Other questions? So if you had I don't know, more time, more space, more money. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> could be another part of the exhibit that didn't quite fit this time around? Well, um, the question is like, uh, you know, what didn't fit? Um, a lot of stuff didn't fit. It's a very small room. And, um, you know, we felt torn about what we had to edit out. Um, and uh, I apologize to everyone who had a favorite photograph that didn't make it to the wall. Uh, but what we tried to do was have uh, the touch screens um, have uh, that capacity to show more images. Um, you know, ideally, we'd have a whole museum uh, that would tell this story. Um, but in that space, I think we did a pretty good job of getting you to the beginnings of the search and the beginnings of the story. No exhibit can really tell the whole story. It's really trying to whet your appetite to search on your own. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Uh, you know, when we're talking about limited space, we're talking about physical space and time and money and all that. Yeah. Is there any thoughts for architects or curators to be using like augmented reality or virtual reality to put somebody in a space that is essentially endless inside of the virtual reality or augmented reality experience. Uh, so that way you're kind of like breaking out of just like the small limited space like our architects thinking of that for the future. It's, it's a part of exhibit design that's still being developed on um, augmented reality. First of all, it's like it's, you gotta have access to the technology that um, runs that stuff. It's very expensive to develop. Um, and also, you're mediating the experience through a screen. Um, one of the things that is good about museums still <laughs> is that they're real places. Um, and there's something powerful about that presence. Um, and when you're looking at Stan Romeda's, um the tags, the real tags that are were put onto people as if they were baggage. Um, and that you see them in photographs, but that's a real tag. You know, that's the thing that, you know, was labeling you as you were shipped off. Uh, there's no, you know, you're in the same space as that tag. Um, there's something real about it that is not mediated by um, a screen. Uh, you know, I, the other thing is like you can, I, even though through AR you can kind of steer, I feel like um, you, when you go through a museum, the physical aspect, there's no lag to it. You, you are there. Um, and there's, there are other people there too. So, um, you know, I think that's a powerful, I don't, I'm not saying AR doesn't have its place, augmented reality. Um, it's, it certainly can do a lot of things, but there are things it can't do as well. Okay. I think we have time for maybe one more question. <laughs> what other museums around the U.S. have exhibits like this? Oh, the Japanese American National Museum is working on refreshing its exhibits right now, and I'm sure they'll have a really great exhibit about um, this experience, the camp. Uh, well, one thing, even though it's a small space, it's one whole story. Um, uh, sometimes when there's, you know, we split up 
all these stories and you know make it into a big museum. Uh, we cannot connect all the threads together. Um, and in, in a funny way, it's like this is compact, and you can get that story, and you can see it as a whole uh, moment. It's not complete, but you get the sweep. So um, I don't know. I actually don't know uh, that many exhibits out there. Each one, I think, you know, there are a lot at the sites themselves that talk about specific stories about that place in the context of the larger. Uh, I think each one has its own perspective. Um, each museum and each exhibit will have a different perspective. So it's probably worth it to go to all of them. <laughs> So Kevin, school children, thousands will be going through it. And I know you said you want this exhibit to, to whet people's appetite to learn more. But what are the emotions that you want people to feel? Because as I hear you talk, you're bringing me close to tears, right? Um, of your, your grandparents and your mother who is jailed. Those are the, some of the stories we don't hear of what it was like in jail prior to, to the camps. But, for kids and for people here today, what, what do you want them to, to take away and to feel viscerally? And now you're being honest. No, no, <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a fine line between asking people to have empathy and to feel something. Um, because, um, well, how they feel is going to be so specific to how they connect to the story. Um, you know, for some people, it's going to be uh, um, Mas Hatano's story about the dog. You know, uh, uh, that that makes me cry. You know, that he had to leave the dog. He had no idea what happened to the dog. You know, they just left the food, and they 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 walked away. Uh, or walked away, they were trucked away. So, I don't know, you know, it, I think it's it's more than what they feel, it's just this kind of empathy for what humans can feel, you know, what they must have gone through uh, as they're torn away over and over again, actually, for some, you know, it's torn away three or four times from friends and family. So, hard to say what I would say they should walk away with, but. Well, if you would, again, you have time to chat with Kevin, and you might want to share the impact that this museum has made since he's here from New York. Um, I have a few announcements because we're going to get um, other activities of today's celebration underway. I also wanted to say that we have another special guest, and that is the past national president of the Japanese American Citizens League, Floyd Shimamura, is with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for sharing your story. Just a bit, we're going to have the ribbon cutting ceremony and the taiko drumming by the Khoisan Taiko group led by Greg Wada. First, some useful announcements. So, you got a handout there and it has a diagram of what's what. So, look for the sign pointing out the locations of the many activities and it's marked with an orange star. So, remember, I told you that this event uh, was sold out. As a result, um, we're having to schedule tours in 20 minute increments. And I know 20 minutes is not enough to get through um, the exhibit. Um, the sticker on your name tag will let you know the specific time of your tour. But there is an added bonus, guys. You're getting a free pass to the museum so that you come back and you can see the museum and the exhibit at your own pace. Uh, you can also meet over there Julie Thomas, archivist at Sacramento State for the Japanese American Archival Collection. She gives a super presentation, and she'll be talking about 
the collection and its many uses, so you can meet Julie in the Unity Room on the second floor. Origami crane folding and Sue for Solidarity will take up the first floor. That would be the California uh, Indians exhibit. The Sacramento Ikebana demonstration will take place on the second floor at the Women Inspire exhibit. If you have questions for Kevin, you will meet him in the museum lobby. There are also refreshments, senbe and water in the lobby. And finally, the restrooms are located in the basement of the museum. So I think now, any other announcements? Did I miss anything? You've been a terrific audience. Thank you again for coming out. In the rain. We'll go ahead and leave the auditorium for the ribbon cutting ceremony and the taiko drumming by the Koyasan Taiko group. Your handout says the courtyard, but we're moving into the lobby. Okay, so go back to the museum.